Welcome to a special edition of Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. And what a treat we have today. We've got, of course, I am Bradshaw, and that is your Chickasaw native and your Chickasaw Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we've got a tribute to one of the greatest catches, catch can wrestlers, one of the greatest trainers of all time, Mr. Billy Robinson, who influenced so much of today's product, both in professional wrestling and in MMA. We got Jake Shannon, who is the owner of Scientific Wrestling and Billy's right-hand man, also ghost read his uh, autobiography, and the king of Connecticut. I'm not sure why anybody want to be king of Connecticut, but he is the king of Connecticut. Matt Granahan, he's also was a uh, promoter and manager for many U MMA fighters in the Florida MMA Hall of Fame. And Berman Law Group is the chief marketing consultant. He also managed uh, the great Stefan Bonner. So guys, Welcome to the show, and we will get started right quick. As long as we can do this technically, you got to understand I'm from <laughs> Texas and Mr. Briscoe's from Oklahoma. We're not really good with anything other than rotary dial phones, but if we can do this and do it right, because we have Mr. Dave Silva helping us, who is good at all this stuff, we're going to have this video that's an incredible video to Billy Robinson, and here, the, here is the video. The greatest British wrestler of the 20th century died this March. Billy Robinson was born on the 18th of September 1938 to a family with a long history of fighting prowess. His great-great-grandfather was Harry Robinson, a bare-knuckle boxing champion of England, and his father Alf was a successful boxer and wrestler at a national level, and so it's no surprise that as a child Billy desperately wanted to be a boxer. But a serious childhood accident significantly damaged his eye and ruined his chances of ever getting licensed as a boxer, so instead he turned to traditional catch-as-catch-can wrestling. And the rest is history. Training under the great Billy Riley in Wigan, Robinson won the British Amateur title, the European Amateur title, the British Empire Amateur title, and with nothing else left to challenge him, he turned professional. He travelled the world seeking out the best wrestlers to fight and along the way he won every professional title worth winning. He starred in a Hollywood movie and hung out with royalty. He had a film based on his life as well as a series of graphic novels and comics. But despite his unprecedented success in the ring, where Billy excelled the most was as a coach. He opened his own gym in Manchester and in one memorable year his students won seven out of a possible eleven British titles. One of those champions was Marty Jones, the last of the truly technical wrestlers, who went on to win seven world titles and coach none other than William Regal. Proper catch wrestling is notoriously hard, and Billy made it even harder, but his insistence on perfection paid huge dividends for those who could cope with his demanding approach to training. He brought us some of the best fighters and biggest names in martial arts, after giving up on professional wrestling during the WWF era, because it wasn't wrestling, he found himself teaching mixed martial arts in Japan, alongside another great from the same gym in Wigan, Carl Gotch. When the Gracie family were dominating the Western world, Billy was coaching a young Japanese man by the name of Kazushi Sakuraba, a young man who would defeat Hoyler Gracie, Henzo Gracie, Hyan Gracie, and Hoist Gracie, and earn himself the nickname the Gracie Hunter. Billy also coached Josh Barnett, the youngest man to ever win the UFC Heavyweight Championship. Eric Paulson called him a great icon, a superstar, and the world's greatest authority on catch wrestling. When Billy came back to the UK to teach for the first time in decades, he kick-started a resurgence of genuine catch wrestling. His passion was always for proper, authentic catch wrestling the way it was taught to him as a child in Riley's gym in Wigan. The way Riley taught it. The way Pop Charnock had taught it to Riley. The way it had been done for hundreds of years. I've spent the last 20 years studying the historical martial arts of England and that's why, on a late summer's day a few years ago, I jumped into the car to drive the 200 miles to Andy Crittenden's Martial Arts Centre in Doncaster 
for the opportunity to train with Billy himself. I had no idea what I was letting myself in for. I've trained with a number of big-name instructors over the years, but no one like Billy. He had an incredible attention to detail. If something wasn't perfect, then it was wrong and needed correcting. He'd stop you, make you move by a fraction of an inch and make you do it again. And he was always right. That fraction of an inch was the difference between doing it with ease and struggling with the technique every step of the way. Once you got it, he'd make you do it again and again and again. Because of Billy, there are numerous clubs in the UK teaching authentic catch wrestling again. There are 17 wrestlers in the UK certified by him and more through other gyms. Catch has never looked stronger. Billy was old when I met him, already in his 70s, and spoke in a quiet, hoarse voice, a result of repeated surgery on his neck and throat. He was an old man, old before his time. He walked slowly with a stick and relied heavily on his assistants, Jake Shannon and Sam Cressin, to get on the mats. But even six months before his death, he still had a grip of steel. He put me in a standing armbar for a photo opportunity and I swear I can still feel it. He was frail, but he had an aura of strength, a real feel of immortality. So when he died, peacefully in his sleep, everyone was shocked. He inspired passion in his students. He created a love of catch wrestling and a genuine warmth for him as a man. His passion for detail on the mats and his reputation for getting angry and swearing at students didn't change the fact that he was a true gentleman off the mats. I was lucky enough to spend time socially with him, and the worst thing I ever heard him say about someone was that they were no wrestler. Billy Robinson was a one-off, the kind of man who only comes along once in a generation. And I'm more proud than I know how to say that I could call him my coach. So you see what we're saying about Mr. Billy Robinson. Some say he's the greatest catch as catch can, but even to be mentioned as one of the greatest, it is some achievement. Look at the people that he's trained in from Johnny St. Marty Jones, Marty Jones, who trained William Regal, who also trained William Regal's son. A lot of what Billy Robinson uh, did in the ring is being done right now by William Regal's son down in NXT, an incredible legacy. Also a huge trainer in AWA, the snake pit. We'll get all into that guys. Welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I even got my uh, my cowboy hat in tribute to Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, well, don't don't go get Texas. give me a infringement there. That's a white hat. My partner wears a white hat. <laughs> he he, you you got that law firm down there in Palm Beach. Well, he he got the whole state of Texas as a law firm there. So I don't I don't know. So you better be careful with that white hat there. But you know what, Billy Robinson's our subject today, and man, I I you know I I've got some great stories with Billy. I have a, a life-changing experience with Billy Robinson. I'll share this story with you guys before before we go on. And yeah, and some call me a dumbass because of what I did, but I'll I'll share it and I'll let everybody else decide. I'm sure you'll you'll decide on the on the majority here. Billy, Billy was a good friend of my brother Jack and I. So we had we had this buddy that that liked to go out in the Gulf of Mexico, deep sea fishing all the time out there. So Jack and I would go out and on Monday we'd brag about, you know, we ate, we caught the tuna, we caught the bay out there. We, we, you know, we caught all kinds of fish out there. Billy said, Hey guys, how come you never invite me out? You know, I love, I love fish. I'd love to go out. I've never been deep sea fishing before. And so, okay, Billy, next, next six Sunday, whatever day we was off, uh, we'll pick you up at, you know, six o'clock in the morning. We'll go to the boat and we'll, we'll go out. We'll go deep sea fishing. So we go out. Of course, alcohol has got to be one of the main things when you go do <laughs> tea fishing. And you're talking about an Englishman and two Indians, you know, <laughs> all, all fire water, all fire water, no, to say the least. But so we're having a good time. We're fishing. Billy's catching in some, some tuna and we're having a great day. So we get a lie tangled. And, and this boat's a really nice boat. My buddy got this really nice, like a 35 foot sea ray or something like that. Got one of those dive uh, dive paddles on the back of it where you go out and you know mess with mess with your line. So we get a line tangled. Billy said, "I'll go out and do it. And I'll go out and untangle it." Now it's about time you get off your big English ass and do something besides uh, drink beer and, and fish, Billy. So he's out there. It's a great sunny day, beautiful day. Seas are just perfect, you know, and everything. So 
Billy's out there and he's bending over. And I look at my brother, I said, Jack, I want to kick his ass off this boat. Jack said, you don't have a, have a hair hair on you if you don't do it. And I think, well, this is Billy Robinson, you know, you know come on now. <laughs> so he bends over and she bends over my foot, just catches a flush in the ass, man. Billy goes, tea cap over tea cap or whatever they call it, right in the damn Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> And man, he's down, he's bobbing, he's weaving, and he's screaming, get me out of here. I mean, he's panicking, you know, because there's no life jackets on. Come on, you know, he's an Englishman. He's, he's a shooter. He can wear no life jacket. So we go wrong. I said, Bruce, I'm going to kill you. And I, I told because the captain's backing up, and I said, Captain, stop right where you're at there. <laughs> I, I'm not going to let this guy on until he swears in front of God and everybody else that he won't kill me as soon as I let him in the boat. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Bob, Bob, like I said, Billy's bobbing and weaving out there. It's so funny. I said, all right, Billy, the last chance or we're going to take off and leave you. We're 25 miles off the damn coast here, too. You know? I said, if you don't swear to God right now, it's Sunday morning, it's Sunday, it's Sunday, whatever time it is, <laughs> that, that you won't kick my ass when we let you back up on this boat, you and I, you're going to have to swim to shore. And for some reason, all right, I, I swear, I won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't harm you when I get back, back on the boat there. So Jack and I go, we pull him back on the boat, and I go back and for this end of the boat, of course, I can fly without getting, <laughs> getting all on the other end of it. And he starts walking toward me. I said, Billy, you swore. You swore in front of everybody. It's Sunday morning. You're not, you're not going to come. Well, maybe not today, but I'm fine this over there. So anyway, that, that I escaped an ass kicking, and I'm probably the only guy in the world that kicked Billy Robinson in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> But that's my story. But what what a great guy, man! You guys had to had had uh, a ball just just being around Billy because Billy's sense of humor was really unique and drive a British sense of humor. But I mean, he could tell some stories and laugh with the best of them. And uh, not only Billy, but Matt, uh, one of your buddies, one of my old buddies too. Uh, you know that that we we talked about right. Billy Wicks there. Yeah. You have any great story about Bill, Billy and John, and in case you don't know, he, he was an old timer. He was one of those Southern tough boys. He never had any formal training anywhere, I don't believe. But man, well, he was oh, one no, of those I can, guys. I can actually, I can actually clarify that he was trained by uh, Henry Colin, and um, Henry Colin was trained by Martin Farmer Burns. Wow. So, Burns. Um, so pops, who, Billy who trained, uh, who, I'm sorry, um, okay, who trained Frank Gotch? He was, uh, yeah. yes. And um, and then Far was, Farmer Burns also had the first uh, correspondence uh, training course of any 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 oh, martial yeah. artist yeah. or, so or me, a wrestler in the world. Yeah. So pops Billy Wicks, man, he was like a second father to me. He came up through McAllister College wrestling in Minnesota, and he went into the Carnies, and he's got some great stories. And <laughs> uh, the story that I love is. Uh, the barkers, the old carnival barkers that would embolden people to wrestle Pops. Now, Pops had been trained uh, from amateur wrestling. He went in to be trained by Henry Cullen, and he always told me about Henry Cullen. Henry Cullen was a, was a tiny little guy, you know, about a buck, a buck 50, buck 60, didn't look like much, right? And um, he would be the guy that the barker would get on the mic and he would say, I know all you guys beat your wives at home drinking beer. Why don't you come up here and challenge my wrestler? And much like David Manning that you guys had on recently from world class, he looked like a little guy. Like he, you know, David Manning was a referee. They used to stretch fans. So um, when the guys would pay their money and they'd wrestle Henry Colin and they'd be, he'd have them screaming, screaming in pain and a shout out to pops, because a lot of what I teach uh, in coaching in MMA uh, comes from pops and also from another guy, Frankie Kane, the great Mephisto, right. who also uh, worked um, the carnivals and was trained by Frank Wolf, the same Frank Wolf that trained Carl Gotch. Um, so it's it's a great history. And, you know, professional wrestling fans, they don't understand. And the reason I wanted to come on here with Jake is they don't understand that MMA will spawn out of professional wrestling from the carnivals 
to um, the UWFI, which Billy Robinson was instrumental in training guys, to Pancras, where there were a lot of shoots, to Shuto, all predating the UFC that was founded by my good friend, Art Davey, not by Dana White, by Art Davey um, in 93 and uh, Horry and Gracie. So a lot of people don't realize the deep, intricate history. And they also don't realize that the man, Count Koma, Mitsuyu Maeda, who trained the Gracies, came out of professional wrestling, professional catches catch can wrestling. They also don't understand that Elio Gracie, the people he competed against were Waldex Zabisco, who absolutely ragdolled him, a professional uh, wrestler. Fred Ebert, another professional wrestler who went to a draw with Elio and Masahiko Kimura. It's the double wrist lock, not the Kimura. He uh, submitted Elio with that hold, longtime judoka and professional wrestler. So Jake and I are here to educate the pro wrestling fan about how instrumental professional wrestling is with MMA, with this recent Endeavor deal. I just want to say I was at a dinner at the John Jones fight with Ari Emanuel. Uh, we're on a uh, I'm spokesman for a fighter's rights organization and some attorneys, and we're working with Endeavor and trying to bring the former Zufa guys in to get to get some compensation for these guys. We're using the same team that did so with the NFL, right? So um, Ari is a huge, huge professional wrestling fan. So this is such an exciting time. Well, I hope so. He just invested millions fan. of dollars in it. So <laughs> yeah. I hope he's a huge fan. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, I know that's a lot of information. So yeah, just so the fans that are listening to this know, uh, beneath this in the playlist on the YouTube channel, all these guys that we're mentioning, we're going to put their matches, we're going to put their names. So these old matches, most of them still exist. Uh, the ones that do, they will be listed and put on here. So it's going to be a one place you can find all this stuff about Billy Robinson, all the stuff about catches, catch can, and all these different names mentioned will be in the in this playlist uh here right yeah. on the youtube channel and, and jake you were his right hand guy right how how in the world does that happen well you know it's funny because um i i started out um just i i was in denver when the first ufcs were here they were it was the only state that would allow um the the mixed martial arts right back hey, they then. allow ufc they allow weed they're just like first with everything <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> <laughs> whatever like whatever man, you want to do, whatever you want to do, we're cool. They just all high. we just uh decriminalized <laughs> mushrooms. Mushrooms now are, are legal. Wow. Here You're kidding me. Decriminalized psychedelic drugs. Yeah, I've never just read that that they just decriminalized them. Why are we yeah, living anywhere crazy. else, Jerry? Why? Why are we living anywhere else? Let's. Just I know. <laughs> I live in an archery clan down here in Florida, and then you, you, you up there in Maryland. There, I don't know, but uh, Jake, hey, Jake, go ahead with that. I mean, what a what a story there. Well, so yeah, it is the wild west <clears throat> out here, and I was able to attend the uh, UFC too, and it like changed my life. I was like, oh my god, this is so cool. I want to be a part of it, and um, I, I actually uh, back then it was like it was the wild west and you couldn't get booked unless you knew somebody and i was an outsider so i had no way to really get any bookings and i was getting frustrated because i was like man i'm young i'm talented i'm in my prime i need to do this but i didn't well, know what was your background there jake i mean uh, the amateur wrestling or what was your background on that yeah i did i did i started at peewees when i was about five and i went all the way through peewee wrestling into junior high and then i, I got pretty sick in high school i had cancer so that kind of derailed high school and college. But then right after I got better, that's when UFC two happened or UFC was in Colorado. I went to UFC two and I was like, man, this has got my name all over it, but I couldn't get in. I couldn't, I, I just, I tried and I tried and I couldn't get in. Uh, I just didn't have the clout. Uh, I was just a young nobody. And so uh, I ended up got involved with pro wrestling and got really interested in uh, the cauliflower alley in particular. And so I got to be friends with this, is how Matt and I know each other. We have a lot of mutual friends, especially in uh, Frankie Kane and Billy Wicks and, and Red Bastine and, and a number of other dudes that were just fantastic to me. And they knew that like, I liked pro wrestling, but I liked the shoot side. And so they started introducing me to everybody. Um, and eventually I got to know uh, Carl Gotch pretty well. 
if uh, if you guys are interested, I've got a, uh, a probably about 10, 15 hours of just conversations of him mentoring me that I was able to post online. It's just carlgotch.com. It's only for people who are really nerds about it. But um, and because of my time spent with Carl, then um, I started getting the attention of some bigger name MMA guys. One in particular is a guy named Josh Barnett. He does uh, now he's doing that blood sport for right. pro wrestling. And uh, I connected Josh with Carl and then kind of quid pro quo. He connected me with Billy. And I started bringing Billy back from Japan to the States. And man, we just toured like the whole world because nobody really knew back then, except me and a few, a handful of people, what a true fountainhead of knowledge he was for submission. And I was like, man, this is so relevant given the popularity of the UFC that everybody wants to learn this submission stuff, but everybody's going the Brazilian jiu-jitsu way. And I was like, I'm going to zig while everybody else is zagging and double down on Billy and just really threw everything I had into spending as much time and absorbing everything I could and getting his name out there and getting as many people to train with him as possible. Yeah. Wow. And, so, so and, bad, bad. Tell, tell us, uh, what was your background? How did you get involved with MMA and professional wrestling? I started, I started wrestling um, when I was in seventh grade. And uh, I was pretty good in high school. I had a, a pinning record at FCX for a while. I've been back to my high school actually to headline a show, uh, go headlining against the greatest wrestler in our high school in pro wrestling to raise money for the mats. They had me back in 2017. I coached my own high school. I coached uh, youth wrestling um, in college. I, I was actually did two sports, wrestling and I transitioned to swimming. Because, you know, when you're a good wrestler, you go to college, you, it, it's a whole nother ball of wax, man. I, um, I did club wrestling towards the latter part of college, and, and I swam, but I always kept into wrestling. And then when I was in college, I started doing judo, and that was back when so many wrestlers were in judo. I did judo with another a fellow wrestling coach in Connecticut, in Danbury, and always did the grappling. I got into competing at submission grappling, um, had a, had a cup of coffee in Bush league and in MMA, uh, met Kamal Shalarus, who uh, was a great wrestler. That's how I started managing guys. Uh, Cause I knew that I was decent, but I was never wanted to be a career in fighting, um, or in wrestling. Billy Wicks gave me the best advice. Um, he said, look, man, he goes, I, I was a sheriff, you know, he taught DT and he was a sheriff for years. And he said, get, you know, stick with your regular job. I was fortunate enough to be uh, successful in, um, in the business world, uh, in the liquor and booze business. I was a sales manager, but wrestling and MMA was something I always did on the side. And how I met Billy Wicks was very interesting. And how I met Jake Shannon, I always trained and I was competing in the the grappling, the submission grappling, and and some freestyle. I did nutmeg open and some freestyle tournaments um, as well, staying in wrestling. But how I met Billy Wicks was like back in 2006. He had a school in Asheville, North Carolina, that was for grapplers. Grappling was really big. You have to remember at that time, MMA wasn't legal yet in most of the United States. And he had a night class. It was five bucks, mat fee. To come to go on and, and and I was I was bouncing around to these different places because I was traveling a lot for work. I had the the southeast region and how I met Billy Wicks was I was always a dirty wrestler and I was riding this kid who was a stocky Hispanic kid and I was doing him I was doing him real dirty you know using my head knuckling him behind the ear head levers I was always a big fan of putting my head into his into his temple and he came over to me. That's how we met. And he goes, come here, kid. And kid, I was in well into my mid thirties. And he goes, uh, he goes, Hey kid, he goes, where did you learn that? And I said, I just learned it, you know, wrestling. I said, I was never the greatest wrestler, but I was always dirty and a pinner. And he, we became friends to where he became a friend of mine personally beyond, um, the mat. And, um, he was one of the few people that I'd share 
personal stuff with, with my daughter. I go over to his house and then I started bringing fighters over there. Cause like I said, I cornered a ton of fights. I competed a handful of times and he had this school in North Carolina that produced some, some good fighters like Johnny Buck, Buck Nasty, who was out of the Citadel. Um, it produced Adam D Hart, who, uh, who wrestled uh, on some, or who fought on some pretty big televised cards. I never was at that level. I was more intermediate in, in MMA competition, but I loved coaching. I've always been a coach and I still coach now. I coach at Fighting Edge here in Florida, in Titusville for a great group. So like Jake, it's always been, it's always been in my blood. Wrestling's been always been in my blood. It's like they say the old Godfather line. Every time I get out, they pull me back in. And Pops, with Billy Wicks, much like um, Billy Robinson was such an influence on Jake, um, Billy Wicks was such an influence on me. And he introduced me to, to people like Frankie Kane that I got really close to. He sent me down to Frankie. Uh, I was, I was. Uh, now, Frank, Frankie, for those that don't know, Frankie Kane was, was an old, old Cardi wrestler who, who come into professional wrestling, but he, Frankie, Frankie also would train guys, but he was also the great Mephisto who would, who developed a, one of the biggest names here, here in the South for, for professional wrestling. And what he, he was sort of a mentor to both my brother and I, he kind of latched on because of our backgrounds to Jack and I, when, when we were just starting out in the business. And then talk to us, talk, talk, talk to us in a, doing stuff in the ring that, you know, we had no idea that we could do. But what an innovative guy Frankie was. Frankie was one of the really great minds of, of professional wrestling that gets you. Know, and, 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 and a fun guy, man. Yeah, oh, my guy. God. Frankie, Frankie owned uh, gentlemen's clubs down in Florida. He did mud wrestling. For a long time, he was, a, and he was a, he was a. John, John was John was a, a, a mud wrestling champion at Abilene Christian University. Right. I think he's in the Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. That's right. The mud wrestling intercontinental oh, champion. And, 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 and her gender, and her gender yeah, yeah, intergender. Too. <laughs> intergender too. Yeah, intergender. <laughs> let me speak this. Let me speak. Let me speak this one in real quick. Brawl, John was in Brawl for All, and a lot of people don't know this. I'm good friends with Dan Sepper. Dan and I have uh, been, he stayed at my house a lot in South Carolina. I coached wrestling in high school and, and for MMA school submissions. And, and Dan and I did a lot of clinics together. A lot of people don't realize this. Dr. Death Steve Williams, I want to give a shout out to this for Oklahoma. A sooner, he pancaked Dan and pinned him in under a minute. One time they wrestled in college, wow. and Dan was great. Dan was top three, but there you had Dan was, was a two, two or three time national champion. So yeah, but yes. Doctor Death, there was nobody like him. And you, oh, you Doctor Death, he played football also, and he lost to Bruce Baumgartner by like a point. Um, he was he was phenomenal. And if he had just focused on wrestling and not done football, he would have smashed Baumgartner. He was outstanding. And the biggest, the biggest ride that ever happened at Gallagher Hall in Stillwater, Oklahoma, between in the Bedlam series of the match between Oklahoma and Oklahoma State was caused by uh, by uh, Doctor Death. He he pinned his football player brother, and when we got up, the brother kind of brushed against, or the the kid that he pinned kind of brushed against him, and Steve, of course, Ben Steve pushed him. Out come, out come the guy's brother from the sands. He made about three steps and he ran into Dr. Death's uh, right uh, and he was down and the right was on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Dr. Death was a, was a bad dude. And, you know, I loved the brawl for all. I loved it. And, um, and you know, Jake has a, a concept and this spa is spawned out of Billy Robinson and I am broadcasting for Jake. That's, that's why I'm in the hall of fame in Florida it's from broadcasting. I also work for Bellator and marketing. You know, I, I, like I said, not so much from being a great competitor. I did okay, but I never won against high level guys. Uh, and I coached a lot, cornered a lot, but, but on the broadcasting side, it's my absolute honor to be broadcasting for shoot pro wrestling. And this is, this is the this comes out of Billy Robinson and Jake. Tell tell them what Shoot Pro Wrestling is all about. Oh, Jake, Jake yes. before, before before we get into that Shoot Pro Wrestling, just tell us a little bit about about Billy as a, as a person when you first met him and how how hard was because Billy's had a reputation of being one of those really rough guys that you didn't approach unless you had something something to do. So 
Uh, he must have taken a liking to you right right off the bat there to to, to share all the inside. But uh, will, will you tell us a little bit about him and, and how much you know about that Wigan wrestling too? Yeah, you know, and and it's interesting because uh, Billy did have a reputation, and I don't know what it was like. If I'm like the uh, the old the old uh, the whisperer for for like old hook style wrestlers or something. But like both Carl and Billy really took me under their wing. And I know that they did not have, you know, they didn't have, they didn't suffer fools uh, uh, very patiently. So, um, you know, if you got Billy and you know this, if you got Billy off the mat or outside the ring, he was a great guy. He was, a you know, now, now granted, I never saw that guy drink water. It was like, if the sun was up, it was black coffee and the sun was down, it was wine or beer or something harder. So I, you know, the, the guy, I went out to the UK with him. One of the big things he wanted to do was to go back out to the UK and, and kind of inspire people to, to get it, the shoot stuff going again. And it was like, it was like being with Keith Richards, man. He was partying and I could not keep up, man. I was like half his age. And I was just like, Billy, dude, I'm going to bed, man. I don't know how you're doing this. He was an animal. So, you know, Billy was like, he was really special, man. Like super smart really knew a lot about history and all that, but man, you get him in or near the mat or the ring. And it was almost like Jekyll Hyde. Like it just was like the second he stepped on that mat, it was as serious as a heart attack. You did not fool around. You did, you know, you paid attention and you got your work done. And, you know, that was, that was really hearkening back to the way he learned uh, at Billy Riley's gym in Wigan, right. Which, which Carl got you this press, uh, junk it called the steak pit and it kind of stuck but you know it was really billy riley's gym because a lot of people use that name now right. um but it was it was specifically in reference to billy riley and uh you know billy robinson loved the way that billy riley taught can, and, can, uh, you, just, can you describe uh bill riley's snake pit i mean how the the the, the conditions the the the, the inside of it because it was bare knuckles. I mean, there, there was no no frills, no 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 whistles at all, right? Yeah, yeah. If you look at those old pictures, it was like a shack, yeah. and like no insulation, <laughs> no mats. It was like horsehair mats. Yeah. No no padding, and uh, it was very very bare bones. You know, probably be condemned uh, today <laughs> by any kind of uh, building standards. But uh, yeah, it was, it was really hardcore training that they did and they were serious, but, you know, I think this is an interesting thing because I, I, I find that a lot of people don't really have kind of the grappling literacy. They don't even know that like pro wrestling started out like MMA, right? People don't realize that all pro wrestling started out as a shoot. And it was really like these poor people in particular in, in the, in the North of England, the, the, the poor Irish that were like the coal miners and, and the real blue collar workers. And then in the United States, uh, the, the guys during the Civil War that were super bored. And it was simple, man. I didn't need fancy equipment. I didn't need a ball. I didn't need nothing. I just needed another sadomasochist who wanted to throw down <laughs> on a bet, right? And we would bet who would win. And, and what happened was these first pro wrestlers they would get done with it after a long day in the coal mines. And then they'd say, Hey, I bet I could beat you. And some of these guys started betting their wages and guys got so good that they didn't have to work in the coal mines anymore. They were making enough money from these bets on their own, you know, betting on themselves as wrestlers. And those became the first pro wrestlers. Right. And then the, in the pubs, they were called publicans, not like Democrats, Republicans, publicans. They owned the pubs. They started seeing the popularity of this. And they said, hey, man, why don't you have these matches at my pub? Because then I could sell beer. And they and the publicans became the first promoters. So, you know, these were all in the way that people bet on UFC and stuff today. People used to bet on pro wrestling when it was a shoot, right? But as it got over and got super duper popular, you know, these guys just could not, I mean, you don't, you don't see Conor McGregor fighting every week because you just can't put that kind of stress on your body. And so that's what these guys were doing. They're like, man, how could we keep making all this money touring from city to city? Well, that's when the work started coming in. They were like, man, well, 
You're right, Jake. But they, they tell us too. I mean, uh, you go back and you, if you're any type of history buff, you kind of look at look at these matches there. You see, they wrestled for six hours. They wrestled for seven hours. How in the heck did, did they do that? I mean, uh, you know, I know you weren't there, but that's just amazing to me that that they go out and wrestle all night long, basically. Yeah, Billy. Billy used to always say he's like, you know, he'd sit down and when these guys would be complaining about gassing after three minute matches, yeah. he'd be like, he'd be like, do you guys know the longest match in the Olympics? And he'd go on to let them know it's twelve hours long. Twelve hours. Yeah. I can't even lay in bed for twelve hours, let alone have some other guy trying to clean my clock. Yeah. Like, it, it's a different era. So. You know, it's, it's interesting because like Matt, I do a lot of coaching. I, I coach a lot, a lot of like high level uh, MMA guys and I tour around doing it like the globe. And it's interesting because people always ask me, right? Because I've got this, this connection to the past and then I, 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 my other foot's in the present and future. And they're like, oh, who's tougher? Old athletes, you know, back in the day or the new athletes. And I, it's a hard call actually, because you know, back then, you know, we just got to be real. People today are a lot softer. It's just a fact. I mean, there's so much convenience in all this uh, where where guys today don't have that grit that, that you just had as, as like trying to survive back in the day. However, what the modern athlete has is information, right? Like I can go on the internet. I could scout any opponent. I could watch any fight. I could get ever like, like, um, I, I can't remember if it was you or JBL that mentioned the uh, Frank Burns instruction or Farmer Burns right. Farmer instructionals. Burns, yeah. yeah, like like that was all they had back then. Now, I have have you so seen have you seen a copy of that, Jack? Have you ever? Oh seen yeah, I, I've I've republished all that stuff. John, John, that's something that you got to put. Jake, if you'd be kind enough to kind of send one to John and I, so yeah. John, you read this thing. I mean, it's amazing. I'll, I'll it, include it, that it. in the in the whole thing that I do with the books and all that stuff. You know, Al Snow has done. You know, Al, Al looks tremendous now, and he's going back to the old uh, Sandow you know, guys, uh, Eugene Sandow, oh, yeah. their training of just, you know, which it's coming back now. There's nothing new, you know, now, now diet may be different now, but the training's not. And Al Snow, man, guys, like John, that's so, training that's so and he, looks, for Jake. he looks amazing. That's so key to Jake because Jake um, did the old school training of Billy Robinson and Carl Gotch. And he does, and, and Jake popularized the mace belt as a tribute to to those guys and i'm going to tell you guys i do coaching clinics with dan severn we've got one coming up in saint mary's georgia here in two weeks and the a lot of the guys can't even get through dan's warm-up because his warm-up is so intense and dan's 65 years old so um it, you know it, this is the thing people don't understand and jake said a tribute to billy robinson you had to be tough to get into professional wrestling back in the day man and if anybody listens to The Undertaker on Rogan, he talks about Mad Dog Buzz Sawyer when he tried to get in the business and Buzz stretching him like a rubber band. Interesting fact about Buzz Sawyer in the semifinals, high school semifinals, and he was barely outpointed by Dan Severn, who went on to be high school national champion. So Buzz was tough, but these guys were taking their money. Hulk Hogan had his arm, had his leg broken, right? We, we've had uh, Jerry Briscoe and Larry Zabisco and a lot of these guys on Old School Shooters, a show that I co-host for Hannibal TV. And the purpose of that show is to tell these stories and really to educate the professional wrestling fan. You know, JBL and, and Jerry Briscoe, you guys are tough guys. You're r- tough, rugged guys. You had to be tough and rugged even to get into professional wrestling. And that's because of Billy Robinson and the shoot roots, right, Jake? Yeah. And Jake, let me yeah, ask you a question because I, mean, I, I broke in with uh, Brad Ryan's. Frank Anderson was there as well. Oh, some, dude, uh, Brad, Brad, Brad came up under Billy. Billy actually, I was going to ask you over. that. I didn't, I didn't realize that until I saw the, you know, it makes perfect sense, of course, but he, he came up, I guess when Billy was training there in AWA, is that where it happened? Yeah, so Brad actually kind of took over the policeman role at AWA when Billy got too old. Brad's a heck of a policeman if he wants to be. Yeah, yeah. He's a, he's the nicest That's guy in the world. Heard. I can't even imagine Brad mad, and I don't want to see him mad because yeah. I, I got stretched by him when he was not mad for about five straight <laughs> months. 
Yeah, I heard. I heard he's pretty mean with that sugar hold. Um, you know yeah, what? I want to. Yeah. I want to be. I want to be fair to Brad. Brad never abused anybody. He did stretch me, and he did win. He did make sure he won. <laughs> but I, he never, never, never to the level of abuse or anything. Like that. You know, people that sell those guys were. He wasn't mean. He was a great, great trainer. I am. I could not be more happy to have trained under under Brad Ryan's. He was. I. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. And and I and I love Brad. I, I think the world of him. Yeah, nine times out of ten, my experience because you know like Matt, like I'm really deep with all the old shooter guys. Um, and you know, I'm going to be real, man. Like these people who talk bad, like you're, t- like you're saying like that, you know, he's a total pro dude, Jesse Ventura. He put Billy over. He's like, dude, people talk bad about Billy. Like he was a bully. I never had a problem with him. I never had a problem. It's like, I don't know what happened with these other people and why they per- per- perpetuate all that nonsense. But you know, I mean, these guys are, were lethal, like, like lethal. And you know, they were cool. you, I, I, I talked to William Regal last night getting ready for this because, you know, his son was trained by Marty Jones, who was trained by Billy. And, and his son does a lot of tribute to Billy because he, he, he likes Billy, you know, and for good reason. He watches matches. There's reason to emulate Billy. Uh, Billy, when he trained Marty Jones and Johnny Saint, would not train them, according to his lordship, Mr. Regal, for professional wrestling. They trained them for amateur yeah. wrestling and for boxing. And then when Marty wanted to go into professional wrestling, Billy almost quit talking to him for a while because that was not his intent, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm good friends with Marty Jones. I when I go out to the UK to tour, I bring Marty on my my tour. Um, my, and Marty's a fantastic guy. So it's interesting with, oh, with some Marty great in matches particular. We had with Finley, with St. Clair. I mean, what a great, great wrestler. Well, so Marty was in Billy Robinson's first class of students. But when Billy, when Billy started getting big and getting a name, he, he was originally from Manchester, which is up in Lancashire County, which is near Wigan, where he trained at uh, Billy Riley's gym. So he started his own gym in Manchester and, uh, and Marty Jones was in his first class there and Billy Robinson coached him uh, to, to amateur um, uh, championships. So, so Marty actually uh, won uh, a lot of British amateur wrestling championships under billy's tutelage and you are 100 percent correct um hearing this from from regal that um you know billy never ever if you heard if somebody said billy robinson told me taught me pro wrestling you get you know they're full of it because he never ever taught pro wrestling like like how you do it at, at a pro wrestling school where people learn bumps and how to run the ropes and never you learned how to really wrestle under Billy. But what ended up happening is when you could really wrestle, you could call it in the ring. You could chain wrestle. You didn't, you didn't have to pre-plan things because you knew how to actually go from hold to hold. You just didn't finish. You just like got the hold and then let the guy work out and then you kept chaining. And that's like, you know, I, we originally had wanted to do the, uh, the Anoki Robinson match. That to me is... The, the 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 epitome of technical professional wrestling it, it, and it, and to this day i think a lot of people still look at that match as the model for a lot of the great stuff that we saw come out of guys like kurt angle and and all those guys that did those more technical matches i mean it, it really is an art form and uh uh i'm glad to see uh yeah i think um the uh William Regal's son is uh, Charlie Murphy. I saw him doing some stuff on NXT, which is fantastic. And, and that, you know, I really like the way WWE is going in terms of, of bringing in all these NCAA uh, athletes, because this speaks to kind of what Matt was talking about, about people can't even do the warmups. Well, heck, just bring in high level athletes. And then we, you know, teach well, them how to move. One of, the, one, of the persons you can, one of the persons you can thank for that is right here on the podcast, uh, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. Aaron, he, oh, yeah. That's he's how the I one that Jerry. signed so many of these great shooters, these great athletes, these great wrestlers, these great everything. He, he so, for years and years and years, Jerry helped build this entire thing with a bunch of other people, but Jerry was the, the point guy out there. So, John, yeah, that's, I, that's, actually, uh, that's actually how Jerry and I became friends and how we met. Um, was for me coaching. Um, so, uh, I, and I'll tell that, and then I want to tell a quick story that relates to what Jake is saying that you guys are going to love. So uh, Jerry and I met 
with uh, I was always close friends, uh, lived in my house for a while, training partners, manager of um, Phil Baroni and Phil UFC and Pride wanted to transition to pro wrestling. And that's how I met Jerry. And then I turned Jerry on to some of the, the wrestlers I had coached in amateur wrestling. And one that he loved was Tim, TJ Dudley, um, who was number two in the country uh, and is actually uh, just won a spot on the, on the national team for freestyle. Um, so I, I, I got to know Jerry that way. And, and people don't realize Jerry Briscoe, the service he did for years. And I want to put him over uh, for WWF was he met a lot of coaches like me and he, he knew Jason Valick from Newberry because I had coached at Newberry summer camp. Jerry was is tied in with the amateur wrestling world and the amateur wrestling community. Now, I'm going to tell you guys a funny story. And, and so I booked Stefan Bonner for his first pro wrestling match at House of Glory in New York City. Uh, Bret Hart hosted that, that show. And uh, he was supposed to wrestle Matt Riddle. This was before Riddle went into WWF. And Bonner, man, RIP, one of my best friends, he, uh, he, he called it. He goes, Riddle is not going to show up. I was a one-man show calling that show. And, and you know, and Briscoe would appreciate that, or, or Bradshaw as a broadcaster. And so um, I roomed with, with Bonner and Queens. We, we shared a room. And he's like, there's nothing on Riddle's social media about this. He's not going to show up. I said, chill, man. He's going to show, of course. Four hours before the show, we get the call that that Riddle backed out, right? So um, they, they put this guy, Sho Tanaka, against Bonner. Didn't speak a word of English. He was an MMA fighter and New Japan wrestler who had just finished a program he was married to you know not in a gay way because yushi sakuraba who was trained by billy robinson right and he had come off of this uh, of this run with kazushi nicest kid in the world we're in the back with bret hart doesn't speak a word of english bonner and shotanaka tore the house down they had a great match Bonner's first match, and it was, and they spoke in the language of wrestling. Show shot on Bonner. Bonner hit that old, you see Luthez do it, that double wrist slap throw, you know, into the ropes. It was all wrestling, and it was fantastic. And that just shows you, you know, I brought guys from the from the cage and from the from the mat into professional wrestling, like Phil Baroni and Stefan Bonner and Kamal Shalarus from UFC. And they're naturals uh, in this in the squared circle because they're roots of the same tree, and that all goes back to Billy Robinson, right, Jake? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I wish. I don't know. This is really why uh, why I'm pushing so hard for the shoe pro wrestling, um, is because I feel, and you know, I think the market is really seeing this with this endeavor. Uh, acquisition of WWE and putting hit them and UFC under the same um, uh, umbrella that there is such a kinship here. And with, with pro wrestling originally starting out as a shoot and kind of fooling around, you know, brawl for all, all this kind of dipping the toes in, you know, I would really, what I'm really, my vision for it, honestly, um, and this is really where I'm getting Matt's help as well is, you know, pro wrestling as, as much as, as, many eyeballs as they got on UFC, WWE has got double. And it's part of the, the fabric of like America. I mean, back in the day, these old Frank Gotch matches, they were bigger than basketball, football, baseball, boxing, everything else combined. And I truly believe that, that this shoot could, deserves a seat at the table. I think obviously the way that sports entertainment is today, it's, was well, so wildly successful. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's bad. It's so amazing. I mean, really what Vince has been able to do, but what I would love to see is to have shoot, have a seat at the variety table, you know, the variety show table where it's like, Oh man, we've got, we've got everything from women's matches, tag team, triple threat, tables, ladders, and chairs, hardcore. Well, man, wouldn't it be cool to have like an actual shoot division where you could put guys like Ziggler or these guys, you know, Brock, 
and you could put them in there, capture those UFC eyeballs, and then you put them right back into the mix with some of the, the worked matches as well. So, I mean, so what I, so what I'm doing for Jake, and we should explain this quickly, four-man tournaments uh, at professional wrestling shows. We're working with the Hannibal and uh, the Great North Wrestling, Jack Kilby, up there to do the first one in upstate New York later this year. And Jake's already done three shoot shows. These are 100% legitimate. I've got a guy, Colin Crandall, MMA Power Hour host, that every week does shows with active UFC fighters that are fighting that weekend, a top 20 guys. Here's the thing nobody knows. They can do grappling. They can do shoot. So we're pulling those guys. We're pulling top D1 wrestlers. We're pulling guys from high rollers that Stefan Bonner was broadcasting for. I was supposed to be broadcasting his broadcast partner this year before he passed for high rollers top grapplers in the world, top amateur wrestlers. And we're putting them into these four man tournaments on professional wrestling shows on the top tier indie shows like great North wrestling. And we're going to introduce shoot. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to put the genie back in the bottle because they say kayfabe is dead. Hell no. We're putting the genie back in the bottle in 2023. <laughs> Jerry, uh, your brother got in a little shoot with uh, Billy Robinson, didn't he? Yeah, it's a, it's a legendary story. It happened in uh, Melbourne, Australia back in the early 70s. And uh, Jack was a rookie. He went down to Australia. Billy Billy had just come over from England. Jake, have you ever heard hear, hear this story? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the hotel room. In the hotel room, yeah. And, uh you know, and, and of course, it started at a bar. <laughs> Most of them start, you know. And, uh, as as the bar was getting ready to close up, it got a little bit more serious. Jack was off of a NCAA undefeated run in NCAA tournament. And Billy, you know, you you college wrestlers, you really don't know how to how to wrestle all that stuff. And, and Bill, Billy, you know, okay, okay, okay or Jack, yeah, okay, okay, you know, uh, you guys, you. You guys can't put anything on you unless I put let you put it on me. So, uh, you know, things got a little, little, little heated. So, they were leaving, and everybody wanted to go go with Billy and Jack. Billy, uh, Jack invited Billy up to his room with nobody else in the room. You know, all the other guys, you know, they were all around the doorway listening to what was going on in there. So, they, I, I don't, they, from what I understand, from Jack told me, they went from like three o'clock in the morning. Till sunrise, about 7 a.m., about four hours, they just, well, they wouldn't continue wrestling. They'd stop and drink a beer, you know, in between <laughs> a, a few things. So, you know, they, they, they say juiced up pretty good. But uh, it come to, Jack ended up with a broken finger, and Billy ended up with a broken ankle, from my my understanding. My, my side of the story comes from my brother, so I got to believe him. So, and from what some of the guys that were in, on the, in the territory at the time, and Jim Barnett, who was a promoter, wanted to fire them both, number one, because of the damage that they done to the old presidential hotel down there where all the presidents used to go when they go to, to Melbourne down there. So it was a fancy hotel. Here's two of his monsters in a room, tearing the room up and, and shooting each other. But Jack, <laughs> Billy went out with a limp and Jack went out with, with a broken finger. And, you know, they had to show up Barnett so the next day. He, you know, he went, he went, he went to Billy first, of course, because Billy was the instigator, you know, according to Barnett. And so anyway, they, they, you know, they, they ended up best friends, but uh, the, the conversation, well, Jack, uh, Jack got the best of them. And this has come from Billy's mouth to me on a fishing boat, by the way, too, because I had to bring it up on a fishing boat. You know, I wanted to know, know the real story. And Bill, Billy said, you know, your brother could do just about anything he wanted to me. And Jack said, yeah, you can do just about anything you wanted to do to me if I let you put it on me. You know? <laughs> and so there they go arguing again, you know, about, well, yeah, you didn't have to let me put this on on you. you know, about that. Anyway, it's a great legendary story and, and two guys that, you know, that are respected in this business. But that, that was one of the first, the, the only, I think the only suit that my brother ever got in in professional wrestling. Wow. Jerry, that sounds like my days. Uh, broadcasting with American psycho Stefan Bonner. He could uh, Mar Marriott uh, in uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina for 864 fighting championships, tore up the damn bar because he always wanted to go at it with me in the bar after his, he drank damn pint glasses of Jack Daniels 
And um, man, uh, it, that's that's what it's all about. And I'll tell you, another guy that that's into that deal is Eric Paulson. And Billy Robinson is featured in my book, Rough and Tumble with Eric Paulson. What Eric used to do, uh, and he's, I think he still does, is he'd go out and he he was uh, he was Josh Barnett's coach for a long time. And he'd go out and he'd get us hammered. Um, and then you go back and you grapple because you wanted to see how you did um, after some some beer and shots. And he was a big, you know, beer and chase it with a shot guy. Um, and that's important. I mean, because hell, in, in life, you're not always going to be 100 percent, you know, uh, when you when you've got to go in those situations. That is an awesome story, uh, though, Jerry. Yeah, Jerry, you mentioned, was, go ahead. Go ahead. Jake. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, he met, uh, Matt mentioned uh, another mutual friend of ours, uh, Eric Paulson. And uh, Eric, he learned uh, a thing or two about Catch as Catch Can from uh, the Tiger Mask group. Um, you know, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's called Shuto in Japan. And it was the first kind of modern MMA, I mean, that was really done as a promotion. And it was actually, you know, it had shoot in the name, shoot to O. Um, and that's where Eric kind of came up, but yeah. that was under that like Sayama, uh, tiger mask lineage that, that was started by Carl Gotch. So it's yeah. kind of, it's, you know, it's, it's always, the shoot is always just right there under the surface. It seems like you guys ever, you, you guys ever had a uh, little Guido on my boy, uh, little Guido Nunzio. No, oh, oh, man, he'd be a great guest. He's got some to. great. Uh, I, saw Nunzio, I saw Nunzio at Agra thing and I'm, ask him and he, he we just, it's 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 my fault for not contacting him i'd love to i love nunzio so does jerry what a we way love we love nunzio, nunzio what a one of the greatest guy. Guy. <laughs> i love i love that dude man i met him a couple times and shared stories he's got some bad bad if you would yeah, shoot me shoot me as and i'm using the word shoot a lot in the uh, interview here but shoot me a, a nunzio telephone number and, and I, I appreciate it man Nunzio was back. Yeah, definitely. He'd be a great guy. You know, another, another guy that could go that I had, uh, you know, I've, I've had the King's court and then the old school shooters. Another guy we used to have on is, um, a Anthony Corelli, uh, Santino. He can go, man. He can we, we, go we've had too. Santino. Santino is a great guest. He, he's a dear friend of both John and I. Yeah. Jake, Jake, going back, going back to where do, where do you see, uh, the MMA uh, progressing to uh, morphing into because everything can't stay the same as we have we've seen it in professional wrestling through the years how the growth of it and everything the MMA of course is just you know we've all we all remember the the tough enough contest that you used to stay at your local bars and how and that that's really the bad only when people talk bad about MMA that's really all they could come up with is those old archaic days but. It's advanced so much, and it's television friendly now. Do you see it evolving more and more in a in a in a good way? Yeah, you know, I hope so. I hope so. I really do. I'm very optimistic, actually, about this merger. So, you know, it's kind of controversial. It's a big deal, but I'm super optimistic because, you know, I from what I understand with this uh, endeavor and and Ari Emanuel, th this guy's smart. He's letting uh, Dana run it, and he's letting Vince run right. it because yeah. those guys are the experts, you know. But I do think there's some interesting cross pollination. And again, this is, uh, I hate to keep bringing it up, but this is what, what uh, Matt and I are really trying to do. When I came up with this shoot pro idea, one of the things I would love to see is some of the, the brilliance that has been figured out on WWE taken over to UFC. Because what uh, the big problem I see with the UFC is it is the exact same format of fight every single time right it's always a singles match yeah. and so you know what i've been able to do with with shoe pro wrestling i have a minimum viable product i've done three shows we've done a, an entire tag team shoot tag team i believe it's wow. the first time it's ever been done in history awesome. tag team shoot tournament and i had world champions on this like high level grapplers and i am telling you it is as hot as anything I have ever seen going to UFC personally, going to WWE shows, going to all these indie shows. It's so much action because really what we do in the tag team. So let's say that, let's say that we've got a tag match here and it's, and it's JBL and Briscoe versus uh, Matt and Jake. Okay. 
So let's say let's say that Matt and JBL are in the in the ring right now. Well, if they get close to me, it's just like a tag team in WWE. If 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 Matt gets close to me and I can blind tag him, the way we've done this is we allow a 10 second interference time where it would be two on one. Matt and I can go after JBL for 10 seconds <laughs> before the ref stops it. And then the legal man has to continue. And it is a hoot. And in fact, not just to watch, but the guys in the gym, once they start fooling around with these shoot tag matches, they don't want to go back to singles. They, they, start, to having, they start having fun. <laughs> oh, it's so yeah. much fun because you get that crazy wildness. Yeah. In fact, it's so much action. I had to have, I have to have two refs, <laughs> one in the ring and one outside the ring because there's so much going on when it's a shoot. And we get entangled in the ropes and, you know, sometimes they can't see it. And these guys are breaking ankles if, if, uh, you know, if the ref don't see the guy grabbing the rope. So it's, it's hot. That's what I'd love to see is I'd love to see a little bit more like fun and openness in the UFC, taking some of the things that are already in the WWE and baked. And then clearly I would love to see WWE embrace some of the shoot stuff that's in the UFC yeah, because yeah. You know, what is UFC? UFC is honestly, if you go back and because I'm a nerd in history and you look back at the rule sets of pro wrestling, UFC is just all in wrestling without pins. It's all in. Right. It's the same format. It's just they took the pins out. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I kind of follow what you're saying there. And I, and I love the concept of, 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 of the tag team and, and, and shoot pro wrestling. I mean, and, and I think it'd be interesting, but I, I, not only that, but I, the, the, the method, but I see it, I, I see a great asset for both companies and the cross pollination with talent. I mean, you know, look at yes. Brock and look how successful Brock was, you know. Uh, Pac, not so much, but still, you know, he gave it a shot and still he drew money in that sport, you know, coming off of that. So there's guys that can help, help, help bring a personality, not saying that the guy MMA don't have the personality, but they can help bring that showbiz personality to it to, to light, lighten it up a little bit and, and, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and go, but I, I see, I see a benefit for both companies, and this is just my opinion. Of course, I got no, 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 no horse in the race or anything, but I, I, I see it as an asset for both both organizations to cross pollinate and grow a little bit, and grow, grow, grow in both directions. I think it's, I think it's right, right Sunday day for them. Yeah, now yeah, that they're know. both, now that they're both under the same ticker, I honestly think it would be, it would, I, I it would be like negligent to not do what you're saying. Like, why wouldn't I take my top guy from this brand? Cause they're both under the same ticker. Now this is yeah, all the same the, company. The, the one problem with that though, it's like Dr. Death, you know, Dr. Death at age 28, he, he probably wins the brawl for all. Maybe not Bart, Bart hit like a heavyweight. You don't, you uh -huh. don't know, but he had been injured a bunch, you know, and these guys are older. Right. You know, that was the, that's the, one of the faults yeah, of did. something like the brawl for all is, you know, these guys are all older. They're not 25 anymore. You know? You know, you know John, you can pro wrestlers, you know, but that doesn't mean that translates, you know, and, the, and these guys that, that are great uh, MMA fighters, you know, it may not translate at all. I'm not sure the cross pollination, um, you know, John, I'm you not can, sure it works. You know, John, you can manage that um, with respect to uh, WWE guys uh, going over. And I mentioned, you know, I was with Bellator. I co-authored the marketing plan when they came to Spike. I worked with, with the Spike TV executive. We were, I worked with three group and we wanted to do more with TNA. But what we wanted to do was we wanted to put the visible figures um, like Tito Ortiz and Stefan Bonner on uh, Spike TV because that's what folks were used to seeing uh, in the, in, so if people don't remember that time, it was when UFC uh, transitioned over to Fox Sports and Bellator was on Spike. Spike had been created, built by the UFC. And you can do that by booking, by matchmaking uh, effect. I, I, Matt, Matt um, I, th I think we're, we're, we're uh, you, you, uh, uh, Bellator and Botan, they best, best of both. They could have taken that King Mo who had probably the greatest personality at, at, at that time oh, of anybody yeah. on either side and made that guy just a mega superstar. I mean, I, and, I'm you know, they, they, you kind of, they kind of, they kind of uh, slipped, uh, slipped, uh, slipped, uh, slipped out on the backside on that. I'm going to give you a story. This is, 
Pardon? I'm going to give you. He was a fantastic amateur at King Mo. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, yeah, 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 national Oklahoma champion. Oklahoma State. Now. Yeah. Now I'm going to tell you guys a, a story that relates to this with King Mo because King Mo is, is awesome mind, and this relates to what's going on now. So I had the 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 privilege of of uh, co-hosting a grappling festival in Miami back in 2018 with King Mo, and it was called Miami Vice Grip, right? And grappling can be boring as hell, right? It was a women's grappling pay-per-view festival, right? So we took Andrea KGB Lee and we took uh, Christy Gar. And it was Andrea KGB Lee against the Crasian Annie Wynn. And Mo and I taught them how to work and um, work that shoot style. And it was so close that people didn't eat, couldn't even tell. And we made it an exciting match. We worked the co-main and main event on the, on the event. And Mo has Mo. I Mo was my favorite guest on the Old Kings Court. And when I when I referenced my time with with Bellator, he was my favorite guy, man. Uh, he brought, I broadcasted with him for RFC in Tampa as well at a la carte when they were around. Great guy. But the point is, is it has to be managed. It doesn't always have to be worked. Uh, you you know, like John said, you get some of these older guys. You have to put them with the right opponent that they are, you know, that they can go over to. That you don't have to work a match in order to get, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but you don't have to work an MMA fight in order for one guy to go over. Yeah. They, the UFC never understood that with Brock Lesnar. Brock swam with sharks, but he didn't have to. What I would have done with, Bar with Brock is I would have built him up and put him against a few opponents to get him some wins. That's what, what, that do, what, what whatever they did, it didn't do him any harm because yeah. it became more. No, no, it didn't so. do him any harm. And, and, so and, he uh, and he was one of the biggest, the biggest draw. The he's the biggest draw. Yeah, yeah, it didn't matter who, yeah. who they put in MMA in. and wrestling. Yeah. So oh, is, 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 is King is King Mo coaching now, Matt? You know, if King Mo is coaching now, what got King Mo up to? King Mo is here in Florida. He's with American right, Top team down yeah. in Coral Gables. Is he a coach down there? Is he a coach down there? Yeah, he coaches at uh, at ATT. But my point, my point is, look at what Bellator did with Herschel Walker. Her, uh, nothing, 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 <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing. By but, the way, but I'm saying, <laughs> but I'm saying, in terms of the in terms of the fights, they built him up. Now he was so he was he was past his prime and he was so old. But people have to remember about Brock. Brock was awesome. He was trained by Eric Paulson. The diverticulitis. He had over a foot of his colon removed. Right. And he still took the ball and ran with it. He did fantastic. But maybe maybe Bobby's last year's a better example. But the point is, if it, it, it's a different world now with this endeavor. And they don't have to put these guys against guys that that, that are going to be they – can, they can manage – you can yeah, manage. I think, I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on this. I don't yeah, think yeah. I don't think there's a good yeah. crossover with. Yeah. I think there is a good crossover from guys going to WWE, but by the time you're taking guys who've been out of amateur wrestling or amateur fighting for many years and have also had some nicks and and bangs from WWE, from pro wrestling, it's hard to put them back into a, a shoot environment, even though they're tough guys. Yeah, that's true. And, and and if they're 24, 25, it to me it's it's just a world of difference. I think the crossover and I think the merger is fantastic. I think the crossover is you're bringing you name X, who X is. Bring Randy Couture. Bring uh, Conor McGregor. You know Couture is still this huge legendary name. Bring these guys, uh, Sonya. Bring all these guys into WWE to to the matches. WWE guys to them and the cross and the more importantly the the wheel and spoke spoke model model of all of the branches that they have of TV contracts and social media and things they have in all the different countries. I think there's a lot of ways to improve. And, and to your point, Jake, I, you know, I love what you do. It's just when, when you've got a, a guy like say Vince who bought a company for a million dollars and now it's worth 9.3 billion. And you yeah. say, well, you can do better. And Vince probably would agree with you, but how do you argue with that success? Doesn't mean yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, and, and, and don't, you're don't, don't be wrong. Right. Not, I'm not saying you're not. I'm you're saying, but it's you know when when guys like Dana and Vince have been so successful, you, you look at it and as, as an investor or as Ari Emanuel would look at it, and go, my God, what what else could these guys do right? 
you know, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're, you're so spot on. I've, and you know, I gotta be, I gotta, I gotta clear this. Like I'm a huge fan of you uh, financially. Cause I, I've actually got my master's degree in financial engineering and I've worked in investment banking and stuff like that. So I love all the stuff that you do on that. And I think you bring a really, really uh, sharp insight. I think the angle to go, cause you're right. Like how are you going to argue with success? Yeah. And guys- I, I, wait a minute though. I do the same thing. I sit there at WrestleMania going, Oh, I'd have done this. I'd have done that. They got 80,000 people out there. And, and I'm still no, going, think, wait a minute. You know what I'd have done? What I'd have done is I'd have done this. No, so, <laughs> so what, what you have to do is, is you're right. No, no nobody's going to listen to that. What you have to do is you have to, in my opinion, you have to take the startup approach. You have to take the, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the entrepreneurial approach. You have to take the risk. This is what I'm doing. Go out, create a minimum viable product, push it, prove it. And then hopefully you get acquired. Yeah, <laughs> you know what That's I mean. Right. That's right. That's hundred percent. Hundred percent. You look, you look at things, and that that to me is the perfect entrepreneurial model. You know, you, yeah. you you're going to do something. You you can't reform Amazon, you know, but you no. can create something that Amazon looks at and goes, "Wow, we don't have that. That's that's important, it important, and that's valuable. We'd love to pay a lot of money for that." And that that's what you. That's see exactly. Product. So, so with shoe pro, like, for example, like what I'm trying to do, cause I, I'm so, you're so right. Like you're, you're a hundred and thousand percent, right. These guys are like gigantic successes. And here we are, this, these guys with this crazy idea, but yeah, if we can get the traction, we can get enough of a library built, you know, of matches and things like that. That's what's happening. I mean, you, you could see obviously what, what Vince did with ECW or he did with, uh, you know, they just buy these old back libraries and then figure out new ways to deliver the content, maybe streaming or whatnot. That's really what what the path that that we're taking. Um, I'm under no illusion that these titans, no pun intended, would even look twice at this model until it's actually been proven to work. Um, so that that's really where we're at right now is kind of in this like startup phase, <laughs> you know, to, to for lack sure of a better term. And that's fine. That's, that's how it should be. You know, and it's like, like the Amazon model, you, you build something that's valuable. It's going to be worth something. And especially today, you know, because there's so many different platforms, you know, back in the seventies and early eighties, you know, before ESPN, you only had a couple, you had only had a couple platforms you could be on. Then all of a sudden ESPN comes along and think, Oh my goodness, we can build niche channels. And now all of a sudden you got niche channels everywhere and TV becomes different and the internet now, and you could do so much off of YouTube. I mean, the, the, the Paul brothers have built their entire brand off YouTube. Pat McAfee is worth a perfect example. Million that's kind of, yeah, that's the kind of model that that's the model that we're trying to take. And, you know, like, it's funny because we've been talking about Billy Robinson and, and the toughness of these old shooter guys. And uh, man, he never gave a compliment. And he gave me one compliment that ended up kind of, uh, you know, I look at pressure as a privilege, right? Like I, I really do like pressure it, it really does turn lemons into lemonade and coal into diamonds and that kind of thing. And Billy gave me the greatest compliment, honestly, I ever heard him give to somebody. And he said, you know, because of Jake, without a doubt, catch his catch can wrestling is going to come back. And so, you know, that is like something that kind of haunts me, honestly. So I am very, very driven to figure this out. How can I bring real competitive professional wrestling back so jerry, so jerry why have you never given me a compliment uh, you hadn't heard it yet <laughs> i've known you for 30 years oh uh, compliments you're not from oklahoma that's the best thing i can do <laughs> but, hey, but, uh, i'm sorry go ahead jerry uh jake I, and i was just gonna bring up break bring up and like a guy that you know we missed out on i missed out on personally because I didn't meet him until late in his career. Was Chell Sean and John, John, John briefly? They oh wanted one across, one across over town. I love, Jell- I love Chell Solid. I, the guy is awesome. He is. Dude, awesome. can he I've cut never, a promo? I've never that, met him. Oh, I've never <laughs> met guy, him. I've never been around him. Not one time. I've been in the same room. I think the guy is freaking awesome. He's a genius. He can talk. No, he's and, smart. He can fight. He's a tough guy. I mean. No, I, I got an interesting story is. about Chael. Chael. Chael and I send emails back and forth. He actually sent me an email the other day and he was upset because uh, Dwayne Johnson put something out about ha- how uh, Peter Maeva um, took Billy's eye. And it's just, it's just factually not right. Billy lost his eye when he was like 12. 
Yeah. Um, and so Chael sent me an email. But um, what's interesting is how I met Chael was, you know, like Chael could cut a promo. Holy moly. Like, like oh, he's great. he had the entire country of Brazil. I'm surprised yeah. it's like. I didn't know they had internet Brazil. in Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I use that on John all the time, Texas. <laughs> Dude, like, I, thought, I thought he was gonna, I thought he was gonna get stabbed. Like it was old school heel heat. Like I thought he was gonna get shanked at a at a show. But um, that match between um, uh, Anderson Silva, where he took it, Anderson, he lost by a triangle choke at like the very last, like three seconds of a. Like of a he, he, he won. Right? He won. He won for he was the, the entire time limit, time limit except for the last. He 10 had seconds. the fight won. Yeah, <laughs> he dominated that yeah. fight. So, so guess guess who was who was coaching him the day before that? Who? Billy Robinson. <laughs> really? Really? Yeah, Randy Randy Couture, uh, and and his uh, his head grappling coach, a friend of mine named Neil Melanson, had yeah. brought us out to Extreme Couture in Vegas. To coach uh, with uh, with um, uh, with Chael the night before, so I got some cool pictures of of Billy working with Chael the night before that match. That's also incidentally the uh, the day prior we had done a seminar in Couture, and uh, Daniel Bryan uh, was at that seminar with Billy as well. So it's kind of a fun, uh, you know, action packed weekend. <laughs> yeah, I tell you guys um, regarding uh, Daniel Bryan. Uh, this goes way back to like 2008. The gentleman that Jake is talking about, Neil Melanson, uh, was uh, head coach for Extreme Couture. And I was out there with Kamal Shalarus that I was a uh, training partner and manager of. He was a great Iranian wrestler. Um, he actually fought Khabib in the most competitive fight Khabib ever had in UFC. And we were, I had set uh, Kamal up to live with Neil. And Neil's roommate, housemate at the time was Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson. And man, we, we trained with him at extreme couture. I was out there for a couple of days and dude, he actually was competitive with Kamal and Kamal was a beast. Like I said, he took uh, Khabib to the limit. So Daniel Bryan, Brian Danielson, shout out to him, man. And, and regarding Chael Sonnen, I want to, I want to say, if you want to see something funny, and entertaining. Watch Chael Sonnen and Stefan Bonner. Google Chael Sonnen and Stefan Bonner MMA awards from years ago. They do this skit that is a great promo. It is hilarious. A oh, great. Well, it's great interesting guy. about it's interesting about Daniel Bryan. Sorry, Jerry, to interrupt, but no, uh, you know, like he he the reason why well he like uh, Matt was saying he was roommates with uh, Neil Melanson. Well, Neil Melanson got the the rub in catch as catch can from gene labelle well and that's why danielson calls his lock the labelle lock as kind yeah, of an what? homage to that lineage for lack of a better term uh, 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 uh jay jay tell, tell us tell us a little bit about uh gene labelle i mean this guy is, is, is a legendary and and every every type of, of martial art that you can get him did you know him personally? I mean, I, I would yeah. I was fortunate enough I, out now. Uh, I went into the same Hall of uh, Hall of Fame class with him out to, at the Gable Museum. I was able to spend an entire weekend just bleeding him, and I I, I pestered him so bad he just didn't see me. No more, Briscoe. Do you know <laughs> enough now? No more. Get away from me. But what a great yeah. guy, Gene. Gene Gene was another guy who was very very close to me. Um, I probably spent uh, six nine months at the gym he was teaching with his uh his partner uh, gokor in uh west uh in um, uh, west hollywood and um in little armenia and um yeah gene was great man gene was one of a kind literally in every movie you watch raging bull the opening scene he's the referee you go watch enoki versus uh uh Ali, he's the referee. Like Gene LaBelle was is like everywhere. everywhere. I love Gene he's LaBelle. like Coca-Cola, he's man. He's everywhere. <laughs> and, 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 and for those he was there the day well. I got married, in fact. He he was at our wedding dinner. Wow. I mean, I love Gene LaBelle. Uh, and that. rest in peace, man. Like that guy was tough as nails, like for real. Gene, definitely Gene wrote the forward to the rough and tumble book that Eric Paulson and I did together. And I, Eric set me up to stay 
at Gene's house in Hollywood. It was so damn cool hearing all the stories about James Kahn, Burt Reynolds. And uh, I went well, to- Who was the guy house. he choked out of Arnold? Or who was the guy, John? No, Steven, Steven, Steven Seagal. Steven Seagal. Seagal. Yeah. Seagal. <laughs> and then, then there's and, been several versions of that. Uh, Jake, what do you know about that, uh, that story? And, he shit. He made Steven Seagal shit himself on set. <laughs> Pardon my language, but that's true. True story. Yeah. yeah, and I'm pretty sure if you and you know another interesting about that in the business, you know, obviously we all know Gene was a was a pro wrestler, uh, and his mom Eileen Eaton ran the Olympic Auditorium, right. so that's how he got to know everybody. He 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 actually learned how to do the headlock from Ed Lewis himself. Right, like crazy crazy guy. Um, but you know he gave. Uh, Roddy Piper is black belt. Right. Roddy Piper right. was a black belt under uh, Gene LaBelle. I'd heard like, that. yeah, you know, man, and, and like, there's for those so that are many watching, great tough guys. We'll, we'll put up the the match of Gino Gene versus uh, Milo Savage, which is considered the first kind of MMA crossover fight back back in the '60s when they when they almost rioted because they thought Gene had killed him when he put him to sleep. Yeah, Salt Lake City, man, Salt Lake City back then. Jake, do you think Gene kind of gets overlooked when, when they go back in history, start talking about the great pioneers of, of both of our sports? Do you think he kind of gets overlooked? I know he does in our sport. Yeah, you know, I think honestly, I think it's because he was in LA. And yeah. I think that like like so he got pulled into Hollywood so big that, you know, it, but you're right. Like he he deserves so much more recognition and legacy and and remembrance and that kind of stuff the guy was huge huge he was bruce lee's bodyguard for right. pete's sake he taught bruce lee grappling all grappling yeah. bruce knew came from uh gene labelle and you can just imagine as strong as powerful as gene is tossing that 135 pound guy around <laughs> you know and and the thing that struck me about when I hung out with Gene, I did his Monday class um, with Gokor, and I sent some guys from South Carolina from Couple MMA out to train with those guys. Was uh, Gene was an all around legend, stuntman. People forget he's one of the most legendary stuntmen in um, Hollywood. Actor, um, he's got poster boards or had at his home of all these movies that he's been in and God, the stories he has. I, you know, I, the one regret I have is that I've never got a chance to do a sit down with Gene LaBelle, sit down interview, but Colin Crandall did, who's our booker for shoot pro wrestling. Colin did a two and a half hour sit down interview with Gene that is full of so much history. And people can just Google it, Gene, Gene LaBelle interview. We, we, we had Gene LaBelle lined up for our podcast uh, yeah. weeks before. Then he got sick and he progressed. Oh. But we, we had him lined up yeah. uh, right before he, he took the turn for the worst. It's one of the, my biggest regrets that, that yeah. we didn't jump on it sooner. But uh, we had Gene all lined up. Gene was, oh, yeah, I'd love to come on you guys' show and all that. But, man, it was great. Guys, we really, we're running out of time here. I really appreciate John and I really appreciate you guys taking your time out today. It's been an educate for us. Matt, Matt, just briefly tell us, tell us what you got going on here now and, 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 and where, the, where the people can find you if they're interested well, in booking in a, you. In a few days, I'll be calling the action for your son, Wes Briscoe. That's in the co-main event against Magna McLaren uh, for Great North Wrestling in Ottawa. I'll be up there Saturday night calling the action. And I am a personality on the Hannibal TV, Canada's top combat sports and pro wrestling podcast. I host a show that you've been on and we'd love to get JBL on uh, called Old School Shooters. And we've had Larry Zabisco. Uh, Pat yeah, his his win loss record in shooting is not. not I'm, not, not I'm not old school. I'm old school. I'm not a shooter. <laughs> I'm like I'm <laughs> like the uh, I'm like I'm like the Washington uh, Generals to the Harlem Globetrotters. My, my win loss my win loss record against hey, Gerald, I saw against, you. I saw against you Gerald Briscoe alone. <laughs> Damn Rock I saw you told me put any holes you want on me. And I, don't, I don't know any holes. <laughs> <laughs> I got to put you over though. You. I got to put you over though. You made it to the finals in that brawl for all. Yeah. And that was, yeah. that was awesome. Also, uh, Berman law group, the Berman team, TBT contact me anywhere in all 50 States for personal injury. If you've been involved in an accident, 
um, one of the most prominent law firms and rough and tumble. You can actually right at this point for this book, you can DM me directly to purchase it at king.of.connecticut spelled out or Matthew J. Granahan on Facebook. I'm at the Maximum Friends, but you can follow me and message me. I'm do this book is 11, 12 years old, but I'm doing signed copies. And also on March 17th at Fighting Edge Gym, where I coach submission wrestling in Titusville, we have a reality show being filmed with Teddy Hart for his new reality show, uh, of course, from the Hart family. And we're going to have him in to talk about the legacy of Stu Hart. Great, great, Matt. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks so much for your time today. Jake, tell us tell us what's going on in, in your life and how, how folks can get in. And man, we've really enjoyed having you on today. What, what, what an education you've given us. Oh, hey, man, it's my pleasure. Like, just, I am so obsessed with this material to have guys like yourselves at that, at the level you guys are, to have interest in it. It's just, it tickles me to death. I'm so, so grateful. Thank you so much. Um, you know, if you guys want to get a hold of me, probably the easiest way is just my website, scientificwrestling.com. You know, all we, what we really focus on is, uh, is Billy Robin style, uh, catches catch can wrestling, applying it to, uh, to MMA. And then, uh, also we have another legend from the amateur ranks, uh, a gentleman you might've heard of Jerry, his name's Wade Chalice. He holds Wade, the record. Uh, he can't talk about King Comedic Wade John is a king. He's you have to record. I don't know if it's still sand, but the record in NCAA wrestling for the most part. He was at Clary yeah, he, Clary and Saint where Kurt Angle went to school. I think they were teammates there for a while too, right? Well, they're different generations. Yeah. Um, you know, Wade was big in the seventies and whatnot, and um, like like he was on the same team as Chris Taylor. Chris Taylor. Uh, so that gives you yeah. So that gives you a bit of a time a time piece there, but like. Uh, Wade, you know, was the, is still the Guinness record holder for the most wins and pins in all of wrestling, the most wins over international champions, national champions, five combat sport, all American and uh, folk style, freestyle, judo, sambo and uh, Greco Roman. I mean, the guy is just like a true savant. And so that's what scientific wrestling is, is we've taken kind of the pinning and the folk style, the funk of Wade Chalice and merged it with the, the mean old school catches catch can from from Billy Robinson and we're taking it to the market. And like I said, man, we, we do, we take all levels, but uh, you know, we've had a lot of high level guys again, like, like a Chael Sonnen to, to Daniel Bryan to uh, we just had uh, a guy who's on the, the SmackDown roster, uh, Joaquin wild. He just came to a, a camp with us. So uh, yeah, just find me at scientific wrestling. That has everything you can get. Yeah, you've also do you also work with Davy Moore Smith, right? Uh, Davy Jr. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so Harry um got involved with our program, worked a lot with uh with Billy Robinson, and he's worked some with Wade Chalice as well. You know, uh Harry, in, in addition to being clearly a a physical specimen coming right. from, <laughs> from strong genetics. Um, he is a legit shooter, man. That guy, he wins all these uh, higher level uh, grappling tournaments. He is he is tough, and he is an instructor with us under me and Billy. And uh, cool. so, yeah, if people want to get that, Regal touch, had come told on me and... that Regal had told me that Harry was good friends with Billy. Uh, it had a real yeah. good connection with Billy. That's that's a hundred percent. Yeah. I so think Billy Billy, Billy gave him some type of certificate award that they had never given out before. That's how that's how a suit that's uh, cool. uh, uh Harry was. Yeah. But yeah, Harry's uh, tough. Yeah, Jake and Ake, it's been a pleasure for you and Matt both, man. Thank you for taking the time and, and coming on our, our little podcast here. We appreciate it, man. And and bless you and so to run it to you guys down the road. It's an honor, guys. So I'm about to jump in the pool. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, and uh, JBL and the great Jake Shannon. It's been a pleasure.